Welcome one and all to I Am Nature. I am your host, Brian Porter, and this week I have a very special guest. She actually just started her own radio show on this network, Revolution Radio. Her name is Karen Smith, and her show is called Radio Free South Africa. Welcome, Karen. Hi, Brian, and thank you for having me on your show. Oh, my pleasure, my pleasure. So, what, we should just tell the listener, what time is your show on Saturday? I forget. It's in Studio B at 2, uh, 2 p.m. Eastern. Okay. Same time, same, uh, yeah, studio that we're in now, folks. Yeah. Saturday's at 2. Okay, great. So, Karen, Karen now, <clears throat> my understanding is you live most of your life in South Africa. Yes, I did. Um, I've only been in the States about four years now. Uh, so I was 58 when I left South Africa. I've got more than half a century of Africa in my blood and in my bones. Um, I was born in what was then Rhodesia, nowadays called Zimbabwe. And um, uh, when I was quite young, my parents were, were attacked there. My dad was on block watch, which was a, a patrolling of the blocks at night to keep the neighborhood safe. And uh, he was left on our porch one night, left for dead, um, beaten almost to death. And that same night, uh, my mother gave a premature birth to my youngest brother because a brick had been thrown through her windscreen that morning and uh, hit her in the head. And so um, given that set of circumstances and given the fact that they had uh, five children under 10 years old, uh, my parents decided that this was not a safe environment to raise babies, and we left and went to southwest Africa, which is now called Namibia. Wow. And we were very happy there. How old were you when this happened, the, this incident uh, there? Um, I must have been all of about five years old. Wow. Yeah. Wow. So uh, we, we went to southwest Africa, which was... A, a, a bit of a culture shock to us. Did you sell your land? Did the parents sell the land or did they just leave it? Oh, no. If you, if you left Rhodesia in those days, you were allowed to take what you could fit in your car. So you can imagine with five small children, one newly, newly born, and two adults, you, uh, you can't fit very much of your possessions in your car. So we left everything. We left literally with the clothes on our backs. Wow. And... Uh, we went to Vintok in, in Namibia, which was incredible. We came from a British colony where we were taught English and, and French at school. And now we're in a, an ex-German colony, very, very Germanic, where you, you had little mom and pop stores. There were no supermarkets in those days, in the late 50s, early 60s. And... Uh, my, my, my mom was horrified. She went into a store and she wanted some bread and milk and she asked the guy in English and he just said nine. And she said, but I don't want nine. I only want one of each. <laughs> well, <laughs> they, they wouldn't serve you if you didn't speak German. So we very quickly learned to speak German um, in Southwest Africa. And, and that is an awesome country. It's an incredible desert. It's the, the Sahara Desert. Uh, um, with a very, very cold uh, current running along the coastline. Incredible country. I mean, once you've been there, it, it, it just grabs you. You always want to go back. But um, in the mid-60s, yeah, the mid-60s about, um, the ANC government were being trained in Angola by the Russians and the Cubans on a terrorism and infiltration methods um, to f free them from apartheid in South Africa. And because a Southwest Africa borders on Angola, their way through um, to South Africa was through Southwest Africa. And we had a house right on the borders of the town. And we were held hostage. The whole family were held hostage for three days by a group of these people um, on their way to South Africa. Fortunately, uh, none of us were killed. Uh, there was no, no um, rape or that kind of thing. But it, it, it was frightening. Well, and once, well, what was the reason they offered to you? Was there any reason given for it? They, they wanted food and they wanted a, a place to rest because, as I said, a very, very, very dry desert. And um, they'd had a hard trek 
uh, you could, as I remember it, you could see it. They were uh, not doing very well. So they wanted a place where they could rest up and get some food and supplies to continue their, their trek to South Africa. And we were very, very fortunate that we weren't badly hurt in that encounter. But, um, okay, well, that's good one, to hear. Yeah, one more time, my dad said, uh-uh, he's got, you know, five kids still at school, um, three of them in junior school, and he's, he can't do this. He just cannot do this. And my mother was pretty hysterical about the whole situation. So once more, we packed up the family, um, let, put our house up for sale, and we went to South Africa. And we lived there very, very... But you sold your house this time. You didn't actually just... Yeah, there, there, was not, there was not a war in Namibia and Southwest Africa at that time. So um, we, we weren't... Um, penalized for leaving or or any such thing it was it, it was a, a route through to south africa but they did not have a war going um at all at that time so how did you guys reestablish yourself after leaving everything behind in uh in, in Rhodesia, zimbabwe no i i was very young and i i don't remember i do remember the struggle that we had um we bought a caravan um, which is not something that uh, uh, that you would recognize here in the States as a caravan. It was a tiny little one-room thing with a tent on the side, and seven of us lived in there in a caravan park um, for quite some time while my dad got a job and got reestablished and uh, had some money in the bank and was able to send us all back to school, etc., because... Um, to this day, in those countries, you pay for school, you have to wear a school uniform, you do not get a school bus, you transport yourself to school, and you pay for your school box. So uh, you can imagine when you totally broke um, and have fled with nothing, it took a while for us to reestablish ourselves in a way that we could move into a tiny apartment and from there branch out and eventually get a house. But, um, you know, I was young, and so... For kids, it's just an adventure. You you don't understand the stress and strain that adults are under. Um, for you, it's, oh, well, we, we're on holiday and the sun is shining, you know. You, you don't really see uh, it as a problem. Everything is an adventure as a young kid. So uh, nowadays... Did you agree I, with other kids? Were there other kids around? Um, in, a, in the caravan park, yes. But there were five of us. And, and we were always our own our own kind of uh, company, because there were so many of us, the, the, our, my siblings, that uh, we, were, we were enough for each other. So we were quite happy um, with, our, with our company, as it were. But my dad did, he had a very good job. He, he, he had a very good career at the, at the end of his, his working life. And um, we, we prospered, because my dad was a very, very hard worker and took his uh, responsibilities very seriously. So, um, when we left uh, Southwest Africa, we went to South Africa, um, which is now the last stopping point in Africa because right on the tip of the continent, and there's nowhere other than that to go. Once you're in South Africa, there's nowhere to flee to, literally. But we were very, very happy in South Africa. Um, my dad had a good job. My mom had a good job. We went to good schools. We lived in a good area. Uh, Did you live in Cape Town? No, no. We lived in uh, Durban in the beginning. Okay. We originally lived in Durban. And um, it, it was a, well, it is a beautiful country. To this day, it's one of the most beautiful countries in the world. You couldn't ask for anything nicer. We have miles and miles and miles of the most beautiful yellow sand beaches. Um, the, the eastern half of, of South Africa has warm seas because the warm um, Mozambique current comes down um, that side of, of the coast. And it is subtropical. Everything grows. It's green. It's lush. It's beautiful. And then you get to Cape Town. And at, at Cape Point, the, current, the cold current that comes down the west side of Africa meets the warm current that comes down the east side. And, and Cape Town is known as the Cape, it was known as the Cape of Storms, where many, many ships to this day still sink because of the horrendous um, storms that happened there and the huge tides 
where this hot and cold currents meet. But it, it, it's a beautiful country. Um, there are the Drakensberg, which is called Dragon Mountains, which kind of go separate uh, the north and south of South Africa. And they are often snow-covered, and uh, you can go skiing there in the winter. It's, it's really, really beautiful. There's rugged terrain, there's, there's semi-desert, there's desert. I'll tell you a funny story. Uh, when I used to be married, but we owned a three caves in, on a game reserve. I, it was actually a timeshare reserve. <laughs> wow. In South Africa. It was set up at the timeshare. They, they took these old caves and they made them into condos. It was quite oh, nice. Wow. wow. Uh, yes, we have an, some incredible cave systems in South Africa. Um, the Kango Caves, for instance, are enormous underground caverns, really, really huge, with stalagmites and stalactites, and uh, uh, just, just beautiful. Really, so beautiful. sandstone there. I, from uh, my sense is that these caves were actually man-made by, uh, by you know, by indigenous peoples of the past. Uh, no, no, those, those particular caves, not so. In fact, there's very little evidence in those particular caves that anyone ever inhabited them. Um, really. There are caves where the Bushmen lived, and there are Bushmen paintings, etc. Yeah. Um, but this particular one that I'm talking about, this enormous, enormous underground cavern, it doesn't appear to have had, maybe they haven't dug deep enough or long enough, but it doesn't appear to have been inhabited by anybody. It's just, it's just beautiful and eerie, you know, and, and water dripping in it. It's just, Really, so you've got everything in South Africa. It, it is the most astonishingly beautiful, wonderful country. Um, up at the top half, uh, <coughs> it's always warm there, but it's not humid. I understand it's not like Florida and stuff. It's always a dry heat there. It's very comfortable. Um, on the on the east coast, um, in Natal, East Eastern Cape, etc. It can be very, very humid and okay. very, very hot because you have that hot current and you have a lot of rainfall on that side of the country. So okay. it, it's subtropical, so it's damp. And um, if, you, if you have a pair of shoes or a leather belt in your wardrobe for long enough that you haven't taken out for a while, they grow mildew on them, you know, from that damp climate there. So that's, that's the one side. But the other side is arid and dry and cold and... We have everything, everything in South Africa. It's just, it's Namib different. Namibia, where you live in uh, Namibia, that would have been a higher climate, cooler. Much drier, because that is, that is actually the Sahara de de Desert up there. Um, and uh, it's, it's very dry, very extremely hot in the day, and can get bitterly cold at night. Um, and the population is, is kind of very sparse. The cities are, are far apart because you have to travel uh, over all this arid wasteland. But again, at the top of southwest Africa, um, uh, is, is some swampland. And they're, they're the most, uh, I think it's the Okavongo Delta is up there. And it is, it's incredible. It's um, uh, kind of like, what can I say, where is here? Well, you have this green water with, with um, uh, moss and things growing in it. So you have everything. The whole spectrum is in that country. And when you consider that South Africa is, is a, a little bigger than Texas, but not that much. Now, you consider in that space, you have an entire spectrum of everything. Every climate, every, every way of life. It, it is an incredible country. And I'm very proud of being a South African. Well, good. I mean, yeah. I mean, it really. I, it's it certainly has. It's certainly one of the the African countries that is best known in the West. I mean, it certainly has a, a great history, and uh, it's probably been more Westernized than most, right? So, it's, it, there's a connection there. Us and them. Absolutely, Brian. Because at the same time that. Um, the Dutch were, were um, founding New York, which was called New Amsterdam, Nieuwe Amsterdam in those days. At, at that same time, the Dutch were landing uh, at Cape Point in Cape Town and uh, forming South Af what was to become known as South Africa. So we have a very close history um, and many parallels between the United States 
and South Africa, because many things happened at the same time. We had wars with the British for our independence. Um, we fought incredible wars with the with, with the black people there, um, which here you had the Indians, you also fought the British for your independence. Um, we we didn't we didn't ever have slaves that came from South Africa, but we did bring slaves into South Africa to work in the the sugarcane fields and um, well, all the other things that, that the slave population did. But we abolished slavery fifty years before the United States did. And um, as I say, not a single slave ever came out of South Africa. They came from further north. Yeah, tell the story about the fact that when, when the uh, Dutch initially arrived there, there was almost no black people living in South Africa. I found that fascinating. Yeah. And well, this is one of the things that the, the, the media has kind of vilified the white South Africans. But because we uh, conquered, oppressed, and destroyed the black tribes. But this is not quite the truth. Because in 1652, when Jan van Riebeck, who was uh, an envoy of the Dutch East India Company, they wanted to start a refreshment station at the Cape for their ships that on their way east trading for silk and spices. And so they sent Jan van Riebeck and a handful of people to do raise vegetables and fruit to trade with the small tribe that was there for cattle and to replenish the ships on their way east. That was all it was. They had no intention of colonizing Africa at that stage. Now, when he landed, there was one tribe of, of uh, blacks in South Africa at that time. They called the Khoi Khoi, which means men of men. They also called the Hottentots. They're a little race of people. They're small, they're light-skinned. Um, if you know what a Bushman looks like, yep. that's, that's what they look like. Now, they were nomadic. They had little leather huts, which they could fold up and carry on their backs to take along with them to where pastures were better for their cattle. So <clears throat> that was the only other color inhabitants of South Africa when the Dutch arrived. It's my kind of people. I love nomadic people. Yes. Well, um, obviously there, were, there was a bit of strife because they, they thought these whites were free pickings and they'd, wow, they've got lettuce and tomatoes and potatoes growing. We haven't seen those before. So there, was, there were skirmishes between the Khoi Khoi and the, and the white settlers. And eventually the Dutch built a fort, which still to this day stands in Cape Town, and um, brought in more people and started colonizing because the people that they brought in first were indentured servants. But once they'd worked off their indenturedness, they were given a piece of land um, to farm on, and they were called free citizens, the Freiburgers. Karen, we still have slavery everywhere in the world. I don't know why people are so amazed at slavery or whatnot. I mean, it's, it's a part... <clears throat> I mean, you look at the economic system of the planet right now. We're all slaves to this money god. I mean, <laughs> we haven't escaped slavery in any shape, or any shape or form, my dear. It's a so Everybody says... It's not, it doesn't mean anything to say slavery ended because it never did. No, but I think today we are bigger slaves because we don't realize it. Yeah. At least in those days, they knew they were a slave. They knew their place in the world. They knew uh, what was expected of them. Whereas today, we are slaves to the system, and don't, most people don't even know it. So they don't know the, the, the expectation of them. It's they don't know it's, 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 it's mind... Uh, Cognitive dissonance creator in the mind, so you don't really know what you are. You don't know where yeah. you fit in. You think you're free, but really you're not, because every minute of your day is, is, is used to, to feed this money god, a bank or a mortgage or a car payments or insurance or whatever. Okay. And any one of the many uh, massifications of, of this crazy system that's sucking everybody dry. No, absolutely. Absolutely, Brian. I think we were, we were much better off in those days because everybody had a place in society. They knew their place. They knew what was expected of them. And, and very few people expected to rise above that place. So if you're born in a blacksmith family, you kind of expected that your son would be a blacksmith. And 
And that's how life was ordered. Yes. But today, today we have incredible expectations of ourselves and our lives, which we cannot meet due to the slavery that we, we exist under. And so, so it's much more complicated, the system, than, than they had in those days, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I know. We, we've definitely gone backwards. I mean, <laughs> I love yeah. the days when the parents were the teachers. They didn't need a school system, all these tax dollars. There. I mean, what do the school systems teach kids nowadays? Nothing really of any use, in my opinion, because what they teach them is to become, work in an office, sit down, ruin your body, don't eat properly, drink water that's poison. I mean, they don't teach these people anything other than to fit into this horrible bureaucratic technocracy that's killing the planet. Who wants an education system that does that? Absolutely, Brian, because I... I find it scary that that I I can knit and sew, make flowers grow, I can grow a vegetable garden, I can I can can, I can dry, I can preserve, I can I, I, all of those things I was taught by my mother and my grandmother. Wow. Good for you. Now, Good for them. People, people today cannot do that. And it frightens me. It really frightens me. I mean for for my first fifteen years of life I made my own, my mom made my clothes in the beginning because I was too young, but I made my own clothes. And I learned at my mother's side how to make jam, how to, uh, how to do everything. We had, we had a whole cellar full of canned goods that we had done ourselves. And, and we grew a vegetable garden specifically for that purpose. And now all those skills seem to be lost. People just don't do it anymore, and it frightens me because they are useful and they're important because you know what's in your food. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, it's just <clears throat> everything has gone. Pish. Well, what's the word I'm looking for? <laughs> it's gone backwards. It's been corrupted. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I, I really do. I do think that the, the day, even like you say, when people were saying, "I don't." I'm, I mean, I don't. I hope you weren't. You know, the, the women were being raped and and by the owners. I you hear these stories about lakes. I mean, I've heard stories that black had slaves in the U.S. <laughs> I mean, but uh, you know, I don't know how cruel. I mean, there's cruelty everywhere. I mean, that's just that's just the reality of humanity. I mean, some people are demented, and I don't yes. care what you do, you're going to have yes. problems. Yes, uh, it, it isn't necessarily related to things like. Uh, you know, having a server or whatever. I mean, I, I, so many people, I used to live in Ottawa, which is the capital of Canada, right? And I had all these friends that worked for the embassy. And they used to love going to these all over to Africa. They'd have a, four servants for next to nothing. It was a job. Yes, yes. And, and we, we had them too. Um, when we became a little better off later in, 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 in my life, we also had a servant who cleaned the house. We had a gardener who did the garden for us. And, and that was a, an expected way of life in Africa, all over colonized Africa. Look, Brian, these, these black people poured into the white areas because they wanted to experience the Western way of life. So they were uneducated because they had no written language themselves ever. Um, when the whites met up with the blacks in South Africa, they didn't have horses, they didn't have the wheel, they didn't have a written language, they, they, they didn't have any of those things. So now you're expected to provide paying employment for these people so that they can partake in the, the, the burgeoning uh, economy of the country. Mm -hmm. So you have to provide work for them. Now, what kind of work do you provide to people who can neither write, read nor write nor understand um, modern technology or, or anything like that? So they became servants. They, they, they did the menial labor. I mean, you're sure, sure you didn't whip them and, you know, throw, no. throw them all that night. No. It's just that we have this horrible notion that, like I say, we still live in a slave state, and it's much worse than ever. Much worse. Well, Brian, no. And in, in the Dutch are very, a very patriarchal society. So in South Africa, to this day, the man is the head of the family, and his, his word is what happens. What he says goes. Now, they extended their family 
to include the servants. So if you had, it, I, still today in South Africa, if you have a maid, she has a room with a bathroom on your premises. So she lives on your premises, mostly. Some of them go home at night, but mostly they live there. They have a room, they have a, a bathroom, they have access to, to the house, they are fed, you give them a uniform, and you pay them monthly. And no, you don't whip them. I'm sure there are bad people, there are in every race of people, and in every society, who do treat these people badly. But generally speaking, the, they are not badly treated because today the, the, there are an increasing number of blacks in South Africa who are looking back to that era of apartheid and saying things were much better then because they all had jobs. They, they, there was food for everybody. Um, the, there was law and order. They were relatively safe. It, it was a good place to live. So we couldn't have treated them that badly. And if they had been treated so badly under apartheid, why were all so many from up north of South Africa streaming into South Africa if they were treated so badly? So if they were being whipped and murdered and, and oppressed, they wouldn't have wanted to come there. But they did in their thousands. Right, right. Yeah. It makes sense to me. And then you look at what's happened in, in poor Zimbabwe. I mean, it used to be a very rich country, and now uh, hyper, that's probably the, got the worst hyperinflation problem on the planet. Um, uh, it's Mugabe, right? He's still the president. He's the yes, case yes, president. There's yes, no democracy yes. anymore. Uh, it's, it's, yeah, I don't know. They must have a real issue with starvation because you can't buy food there. I guess if you have enough land to grow food, you're okay. But he, he is the dictator of dictators. And he lives like a queen or a king. He used to live back in, in, the, in the, you know, the days of, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. of royalty. Okay. And a complete, he's completely insensitive. He's just, he's pretty, he's pretty much right at the top of the worst list of, of rulers on the planet. Well, he has to be because he is responsible for hundreds of thousands of deaths of his own people. Because, um, Brian, I don't, I don't think people understand that in Africa, it's not one tribe of African. In South Africa itself, there are more than 11 tribes. There are 11 official languages in South Africa since oh. the end took over. Um, and each of these tribes have their own king or chief, and under them sub, sub chieftains, and they still live that tribal way. So it is very hard for, uh, for them to take over a country and run it any other way than, than the tribal way, where you're the chief and, and your word is, is what happens, or it's off with your head. You know, I, they don't know any other way, and they don't want to live the Western way. Um, for instance, our president, Jacob Zuma, in South Africa, he never went to school. He was a goat herd for his father, and he was taught to read and write by a, a person who had a standard four education. And that was all the education he ever had. He could read and write. Now, he is president of one of the richest, mineral rich countries in the world but has no clue about how anything works. So the country has gone backwards. There's no electricity. They are suffering. This week the water has been turned off in many cities because they've had a drought and now there's no water. In Durban they're piping seawater into your home. Now you know for yourself you can't drink that stuff. Oh, <laughs> The Minister of Water says is assuring people that it's perfectly safe, and they're pumping it direct from the sea into the houses. So can not you imagine that? Not desalinating it or anything? No, no, oh, no. And she said oh, it's oh, the best okay. thing. The whole country is going to the dogs, my dear. It's so sad. Well, it's it's it's, it's, a, it's a, an absolute disaster, Brian. You have no idea. I don't know if you know about the electricity crisis there. But, um, um, no, I'm, it, it, it's coming here, though, but, yeah, I, I'm sure, uh, well, at least in the U.S., Canada is uh, probably one of the best places to live on the planet, in my opinion. You know, I'm up in Canada, so uh, we're very lucky here, but, you know, we have to smarten up because it's all going to happen here, too, if we don't smarten up. But, well, that's my, 
That's my point, Brian. I've been shouting, shouting, shouting for years. Look at South Africa because this is what's coming your way. Look and learn and prevent it before it happens. But people didn't want to look and people didn't want to hear and now it's all over the world. But in South Africa, for instance, there's been no maintenance on the power stations for 21 years. So they are falling apart. Now, with a burgeoning population, because they also have refugees from other there are down there? I hope not. Sorry? Are there any nuclear power plants? There is one. I call and it two. This, this, this is my point, which I'm leading up to, Brian. Oh. They, they are signing an agreement with Russia to build six more nuclear power plants. Now, that is a global disaster in the making because if they cannot maintain the coal plants which they have got, what is going to happen now? The Russians are there. Yes. The nukes. Yes. Uh, I, uh, you know, well, I think Putin's a much better leader than Obama, but I'm disappointed to hear this because I was, I was hoping he'd be there selling oil because I'm one of the uh, few environmentalists that think that Coal's a lot better than nukes. Nukes are the worst of the worst, and we've got, uh, well, they've dumped a couple hundred tons of uranium, uh, depleted uranium in the Middle East. That's why everybody thinks they're running away because their house is being blown up. No, it's because the air is toxic. They know this. I mean, I'm, I've spoken to many people who, or who've come here. They say, oh, no, yeah, you can't breathe the air without dying there. It's, it's that bad. I well... Mean, honest to God, but nuke power is, is the killer of the... Because it's going to be here forever. Okay. Yes, exactly. Exactly. And in a third world country where they cannot maintain the roads or the water system or their, the, the coal fired power plants, what is going to happen? Yeah, and they don't understand the problem. You know, they could have another revolution or some big battle between different tribes and they could blow these things up as part of the well, terrorist uh, campaign. I mean, oh, I can't believe the Russians are being this dumb. Well, you know that South Africa is part of the BRICS um, uh, agreement. Well, yes, so. that's the last country in the name. It's The S stands for South Africa, yes? Yes, yes. yes. And, and they always had an alliance. I'm, I'm getting feedback. Are you getting feedback, Brian? I'm, I'm clear as can be. Okay. Uh, so then I'm not going to worry about it. Um, <laughs> they, they've always been aligned with Russia and China and Cuba. Now, in 2008, the, the Chinese in South Africa were formally and legally... Okay, you're, you're gonna, yeah, it's bad now. Uh, what, what am I going to suggest is that you turn down your speaker a bit, maybe. Are you on a headset? No, my headset broke. Okay. Is that better? Yeah. Okay. No, I've still got feedback. Get closer to the mic and turn down your... I find that's the key. Get a little closer okay, to the mic better? and put, uh, shut down your speaker volume and then that should prevent it. Is that better? Yeah. Okay, so they've always been aligned with them. And in 2008, the Chinese in South Africa were declared legally black so that they didn't have to abide by the laws, the, the broad-based... Black. Wow, this is bad. This is bad. Strange, eh? Right in, right in. Even I'm getting it. Yeah, you're, even my voice is doing it to you now, eh? Yeah, I don't know what it is. Weird. Yeah. Because I, I'm, I'm fortunate because my system, I don't even need to use a headset. Uh, most people I, do. I've never had this problem, so I don't know what it is. It's kind of, it sounds like almost like a bit of a delay. Why don't you let me uh, disconnect you and then reconnect with you, okay? All right, let's do that. Okay. I'm just going to hang up. I'll call you right back. So, folks, I just have to reconnect with my guest here. We're having a problem with the, the sound quality here. So just give me a sec here. Oh, she's right there. Good. Trying to get this, uh, yeah, sound problem solved. Is it better? No. I, sounds good to me. <laughs> okay. Okay, I'm still getting the feedback. But anyway, there, there are 
laws in South Africa, which are kind of an affirmative action thing. And so the, the Chinese have, infl- uh, have influxed into South Africa to such a large degree that the, the government declared them as black people so that they don't have to conform to the laws that apply to the white people in South Africa. So the BRICS alliance is of great importance when you look at South Africa because it, it, it is the communist um, or ex-communist people that are getting control there because the Chinese own mo- most of the mineral rights in South Africa, which is frightening. Mm-hmm. Well, I mean, I... I kind of like the Russians uh, much more than the Chinese, I'll put it that way. The Chinese are really cruel and mean to their own people, and I, I find that despicable. Um, yes, they Russians are. Russians don't have that tendency, so I am concerned. I, I think the BRICS is a good thing in, in some ways because we have to counter the American imperialism because they have basically a military base on every, almost in every country. I guess yeah. there isn't one in South Africa. Is there one in South Africa now, a military uh, base in the Americans? No. No, there's a Chinese military base in South Africa, but not an American one. Okay, so it's one of the areas. Yeah, yeah. That that's this is all going to be changing too, soon too, because um, yeah, it, it could lead to another world, actually a world war. Hopefully not, but there's definitely a changing of the guard between the BRICS and the American uh, dominance. The West is is going down, and the BRICS is coming up. And uh, absolutely. That. Because the, the, the BRICS was their own bank now, their own international monetary fund, as it were, and uh, their phasing out of the petrodollar is going to be a, gr- a great problem for America. Mm-hmm. And it's going to be a big problem. It could collapse the entire economies, you know, uh, but, but, but they are going to do it. They've got yeah. it. It's, it's really like fault where, the Americans for being so... Uh, <clears throat> cruel and mean to the countries they were dealing with and forcing them to do business with them through their military industrial complex. Um, but I don't really think the BRICS is going to be that much different. I really don't. It's unfortunate. For In my books, big is bad, period. I agree uh, with you totally. Better to go small like Iceland's done, completely independent, uh, pull out of this horrible international banking system, Take a take the heat for five six years, and then rebuild your economy from scratch. I mean, this is just a horrible trend. We've got one hegemony replacing another one, and I don't think yes. anything's going to change. In fact, it could get worse. Yes, yes, uh, it, it has to get worse before it gets better, Brian. I don't I don't believe that this trajectory that we're on. Uh, it has gained so much speed. I, I, I find it very difficult to believe that we're going to be able to stop it. Yeah, I'm very disappointed because the Russians know there's alternative ways to make power. Uh, and they have so much oil there, and I thought they might start shipping it down or something. Uh, there, is there a lot of coal in South Africa for mining? Oh, overabundance of coal. Absolute huge. Uh, in fact, during the apartheid years when there were sanctions against South Africa and we could not import uh petrol, gasoline, Um, we developed a way to make gasoline from coal. uh, A huge, huge place called Cecil uh, does that to this day. But it's a very long, difficult process, so there's never enough. And that is the one thing that South Africa does not have is petrol. Um, So uh, they're at the mercy of the world, uh, literally, if they start sanctioning South Africa again, I think BRICS would step in and save them at this stage. But during sanctions and uh, during the apartheid regime, we could not get petrol for love or money. So it was very difficult because we were fighting a war on our borders against the the Cubans, um, holding the communists at bay, and fighting an internal terrorist war with the ANC in the country, and we couldn't get petrol to supply our troops and our police. It was a very, very difficult time. And I do believe that that is partly uh, the reason why we handed the country over to the ANC um, on being um, extorted by the Western world for our terrible ways. Um, But I, I do believe that that was part of the reason because we were finding it very difficult to fight this, these two wars with no petrol for our vehicles. 
Yeah. Yeah, they held it over your head, sort of. Yeah, Pretty but, much. You know, the, um, the real solution is, is uh, green power sources. Like, uh, I'm friends with one of the top scientists in the world, James McCainy. Uh, of course, you know, he can, this guy can create um, rocket ships uh, running on the electrical currents of the Earth and the whole solar system. Uh, he's a genius. He's like a Tesla, but he's been pushed out of everything because he's too honest and he's too good. But he's come up with this thing called a wing wheel, which basically is a great harnesser of wind energy, much better than these ridiculous, like, three prop things that create almost no energy. And uh, that would be the solution. Wing wheel, solar, a lot of sun down there, I expect. Solar would be a much better. Is there any hot springs down there? Is there any volcanoes and that kind of stuff in South Africa? Uh, no, no. We have, we have, I think, two or three areas with hot springs, but that really no volcanic um, action whatsoever. Okay, so geothermal is not the best for you. No, but, no. Uh, but you can make endless power with wind and solar and i cannot believe that the russians are taking their their technology to a country that you that is so unstable that could you could have another fukushima there and then there goes the indian ocean and you've got already the fukushima is almost is killed half the life in the pacific and it's only been what going for four years now i mean it's unbelievably toxic uh when you have a, a full uh, china syndrome blow i mean it's just they, you know, mm-hmm. Karen, they don't even know what it creates. They don't even know. They, they, they wanted to experiment and try to create a China syndrome kind of system or a, a experiment, and they said they couldn't do it because it was too safe to contain the result. So they don't even know what they're creating or what they've created over there. It's worse than you could ever imagine. No, I know. And, and, and never mind where they're going to, to keep the, the used um, nuclear stuff in South Africa. I have no idea. I well, have they no just idea. people with it, Karen. They just take it and they make bombs with it. <laughs> I mean, that's how crazy yeah. this girl's gotten. And that's yeah, what I, they I, dump I, it every... It's, now it's in the Ukraine and it's all over the Middle East. So that's what they do with it. People, you know, I hate to tell you people, but we live in a world run by absolute nutbars. <laughs> For sure. Nutbars. For sure, Brian. It, it's ridiculous. But, you know, so so the South African situation is something that people should be watching because all of this is happening with no attention from the media or the world. And it is a, a just this nuclear power thing scares me to death because in the hands of those people, it is, it's a ticking time bomb. Yeah. It really is, you know. Uh, and they won't be able to turn around. Well, it'll be too late to turn around and say, well, it's apartheid's fault. Because I'll, I'll tell you a, a really... A, a, well, let me make another point about nuclear power, though, Karen, and I'm really glad you brought this up, because this is... It, right now in the world, there's about 430 plants in the northern hemisphere. As far as I know, there's only four um, major uh, nuke plants in the world in the southern hemisphere, which is a real godsend for the planet. They're going to put six in South Africa and start putting these things in the South. This is not good at all. No, no, it is not good because South Africa has got two different oceans. It's got the Indian and and the Atlantic, which meet at at, at Cape, Cape Point. Point. Yeah. yeah. So you have you have got two oceans which we can destroy just by having these things there. And, well, and you have to put them on water because they don't leak. But for some reason, they need to be on water. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's, it's, it's crazy. They don't leak, but oh no, they have to be on water. Well, why do they have to be on water if they don't leak? <laughs> well, the one that we do have, there, there is one already in South Africa. The one that we do have is right on the coast on the Atlantic Ocean. So, of course, they're all on water because they leak and they don't want to have the leaking on land because that's too obvious. So they got to yeah. go to the ocean or into a yeah. lake. We have one right here in Toronto. It's the only bad part about living here, I must admit. It's this horrible nuclear power plant. And there's a nuclear processing uh, town not far up from there. It makes, believe it or not, it takes uranium, makes it into a powder, which is just wonderful. That gets out. It goes everywhere. Um, but the whole town is like a Chernobyl. The whole town. you know. They, they, but in Canada, we don't think that looked kind of funny to put a fence around it and move people out. So what they've done is they said, we're just going to move all the earth in a, a three three feet down and put in a big pile and put cement over top of it. But they said that three, four years ago, and they've done absolutely nothing. 
The major highway in Ontario goes through this toxic waste dump of, nu- of nuclear waste. Yeah. Yeah. So the craziness is everywhere, but I, I, I'm just uh, reassuring you that it's, it's, it's pretty much worldwide. But, uh, yeah, I, I'm very, cause South Africa, see, what to me, South Africa is like a gem of the planet. The whole thing should be protected by a UN, whatever, you know. It should be like a place where we shouldn't allow this kind of stuff. Africa, as far as I know, has no new plants. They shouldn't be allowed in these places. No, they shouldn't. They shouldn't, because these people, Really, 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 Brian, they do not have the technological ability to maintain and look after them. Well, no, now, they're I, obviously going to bring in people, you know, they'll, they'll bring in their yeah, own scientists and uh, who knows, they're probably, uh, you know, it sounds to me like, it's again, it's the same thing here, you know, the Chinese came here and built half the oil sands. Uh, they they had a whole separate runway, and they bring in 747s, the Chinese laborers, bringing them in 24-7. Uh, mm-hmm. you know, it, I don't know what it is about the Chinese, but they seem to have like a free, they have like an international passport. <laughs> you can go anywhere they want. It's amazing. Yeah, and yet they don't want anybody there. <laughs> yeah, one of those things. It is just one of those things that makes you go, hmm. So as we started building these things, they're all they're also extremely expensive. I know, I know they are, and this country is broke. I mean, how can they afford it? I can't believe the Russians are going to lose all their money. They're never going to get paid back for this stuff. No, I don't think so either. Because you just said how Zimbabwe uh, they have the highest inflation rate practically in the world. Now in Zimbabwe there is a three trillion dollar note. That, that doesn't buy you very much, but they have this note. And yeah. the note has an expiry date stamped on it. Now, that country that has that kind of money is refusing to take South African rands as currency in Zimbabwe. So the the currency of South Africa is worth nothing, absolutely nothing, if Zimbabwe is refusing to take it as payment. So how do they think they're going to pay for this? I have no idea. I have absolutely no idea. They're, they're doing the same thing that um, Obama is trying to do here. They're talking about instituting a, a rich tax. So if you earn $10 million a year, you'll get taxed 72%. And if you earn more than that, well, you'll get taxed 100%. That, that kind of thing is what they've been talking about in their meetings that they had last week. But even that is not going to help because... Well, there's not many people making a lot of money in South Africa right now, are there? There's not that many rich people in South Africa. I think most um, of them is gone already. No, you see, the, the thing is, Brian, the rich people remain because they already have a visa in their passports. They have money offshore. And while they can still make money, they're going to stay there and make money. And okay. when it hits the fan, they'll leave. The problem is... There is only the very rich and the extremely poor. There is nothing in between. There's no middle and, class anymore. No. And the, the unemployment rate um, is about 50%. So uh, can, can you imagine that there are approximately 6 million taxpayers in a, in a population of 70 million? So they are having to pay all the government grants and all the child grants and all the things for the rest of these people. And it just can't work. It can't work. The system has to break uh, any day now. And add to that the hundreds of millions of fraud and corruption in the government and in the municipalities, which are here town councils. Um, municipalities, that the fraud that has been discovered is shocking, much less the fraud that hasn't been discovered yet. So, there so is they're very- basically uh, taking tax dollars and basically if you're in the government, you take it and you run. That's the way it works there. Yeah, pretty much. Pretty much. It's a gravy train. Yeah. The, the, um, the, the president there was a, a high up officer in the armed wing of the uh, African National Congress during the, the the struggle and he became president because you don't vote for a person for president in South Africa you vote for a party and then the party uh, uh, decides who the president is going to be 
So you have this mass. You've got 3.5 million whites, a small number of Indians, and a small number of coloreds. The rest are black who vote ANC. No matter what happens, they vote ANC. So they're going to keep these people in power. You're not number 10 to 1. Literally, yes, yes. Yeah. And and being murdered wholesale, I, I will get to, to that. It's a, we'll cover it's that a, more in the second hour, yeah, the violence. Yeah, that's the, the, that is a horrible subject, but yes. So, so you have this incredibly small taxpayer base that are taxed beyond anybody's endurance uh, for corruption and fraud. Now, President Zuma said, because when he became president, he had 700 criminal cases against him. Fraud and corruption and rape and all kinds of things. 700 charges against him when he became president, which have disappeared just magically, by the way. Now, um, he said that a corruption and fraud are a Western paradigm. So you cannot bring charges of that sort against him because he's not a Westerner. And that was the end of that. Finished. Goodbye. No more No more charges against no me. No riots in the streets? Nobody complaining about this? No. No. There are riots in the streets every single day, but not about that. Because I think, from the African viewpoint, if he, who was a goat herd, can reach those levels where he has private jets and this huge mansion that he's just built um, with taxpayer money, for himself and his four wives and his 20 children. If, if he can reach those levels, then they can too. So they see it as an example of what is possible. Okay. All right, Karen. We'll have to take a break here, but fascinating discussion. I'm learning a lot about South Africa. Welcome back to I'm Nature. I'm your host, Brian Porter, and this is the time of my show when I usually uh, discuss the importance of supporting Revolution Radio. For me, folks, it's a pretty simple equation. Five bucks a month will will meet your uh, commitment that I believe uh, all people can afford. It's the best uh, way to spend five bucks here, in my opinion, is to get the archives. You have access to 80 shows um, it's just, I mean, there are some amazing people on this, on this platform. There's two platforms, uh, A and B going 24 seven, and there's just so much great content. Uh, I, I usually have a couple of shows I grab uh, as well as my own every week. So it's really, a, a great way to spend five bucks because then you gain the knowledge, the perspective, and you also help this platform because it's, it's listener sponsored um, we have our expenses. I think it's about 40, 4300 bucks a month to keep this place going. And I'm actually amazed that Hawk can do it for that. He obviously takes absolutely no pay for his countless hours of work. That's just his minimal expenses, folks. So I hope you appreciate that everybody here is working for nothing. Uh, but really to uh, get out the word that we uh, care and we want to try to help fix this planet. So... Uh, Let's get back now to my interesting uh, guest, uh, uh, Karen Smith, uh, right out of South Africa, lived there almost all her life, and she's here to offer, uh, you know, a ground, you know, a ground floor view and a very accurate view from what I'm hearing of what's actually happening over there. So, Karen, where do you want to pick it up? Do you want to talk about the violence against whites there since the ANC came into power? Yes, and I, I think a good place to start is with St. Nelson Mandela, because that is another um, falsehood that, that somehow the media of the world have built up a, around this man. Nelson Mandela was a communist and he was a terrorist. And he did not go to jail for fighting for the freedom of his oppressed black brothers. He went to jail for terrorist acts, for murder. And uh, when, he, when he was... Um, charge, his charge sheet had 170 charges on it. Of that 170, he pled guilty to 156. Now, in any country in the world, he would have been, the death sentence was still uh, valid in South Africa at that time, so they could very well have sentenced him to hang. 
But in the interest of not creating a martyr, which didn't work out very well for them, they sentenced him to life imprisonment. Now, he he was not a good man. He was not a man of peace. He was a communist. He was a terrorist. He was responsible for, I don't know how many hundreds of white deaths. Um, they bombed police stations. They bombed railway stations. They bombed um, restaurants. Uh, my, my aunt was pregnant, and I remember clearly digging through the rubble of a restaurant to find her body. And this was almost an everyday occurrence against white South Africans at that time. So in any country in the world, this man would have been sentenced to death, but he wasn't. And then the other thing is this little room on Robben Island where people go and visit to this day, the little shrine to St. Nelson. The other thing, uh, interesting thing, is that his wife was always very rich through this whole thing. How did that happen? How did she have such a nice place to live? Because he was supported by by the Cubans and the Russians. And and most of the ANC leaders were at that time. Um, And besides, he was a lawyer. Now, if it is Ah. true, that our that our education system for the blacks in South Africa was non-existent. We didn't educate them. We refused them an education, as the world says. How did he become a lawyer at the University of Fort Hare, built, founded, and, and taught at by the whites of South Africa? You know, people don't look beyond the, 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 the media garbage that is fed to them. So this man was a terrible, terrible man. You can Google the transcript of his trial and see for yourself. Anyway, so he did live in this little cell on Robben Island for 17 years. And then they offered him unconditional freedom if he would renounce violence, which he would not do. So they allowed him, they gave him a four bedroom house with a swimming pool, a pool table, his own uh, butler, chef and and personal assistant on the grounds of a prison where he welcomed dignitaries from all over the world and talked to them. So that was how he spent his final 10 years in prison. I would love to have a prison like that myself, paid for by somebody else. And he's the only one who lived there? He was the only prisoner? uh, No, there were prisoners in the prison, but this was on the grounds of the prison where he had this palace. Oh, he he had his own private residence. Absolutely. And the last the last 10 years of his prison sentence. So when he was released, it really was from a really good life. But, but let's, his, I, this is a, for me, this is important, though. Do you believe that um, the, the whites were limiting the blacks advancement within the Western system? Do you think that there was discrimination based on purely on race versus uh education, uh, ability to fulfill employment expectations, job requirements. Was that an issue or was that not an issue? I, I do believe that that did exist. Okay. I do believe that. But I mean, it wasn't you, perfect, was what I'm saying. It wasn't all... No, you know. no, no, no. I, I, I am not an apologist uh, or, or uh, making excuses for the apartheid system. But, but you have to understand that a very small white minority were trying to protect themselves against these incoming masses of blacks who warred with each other all the time. They didn't want to live with each other. They, they, they didn't want anything to do with each other. They just wanted to take part in this uh, richness of South Africa. So we created homelands for each of them. The Zulus had Zululands. The Swanas had uh, had their own place. The Swazis had Swaziland. The Vendas had Venda. The Lesotho's had Lesotho, etc. So each of the tribes had their own homeland. Now these were not uh, in the worst and unerable areas of South Africa because Zululand takes up the biggest portion of the subtropical lush area of South Africa and it is still ruled by its own king today, paid by the taxpayers and it is still called Zululand and there is still a Swaziland and there is still a Lesotho ruled by their own kings. So what we did was gave them each their own homeland ruled by their chiefs and we built them roads and hospitals and schools and universities, which were paid for by the white taxpayers. And and what so, we wanted and these to were, they were in effect 
newer residents of South Africa than the, than the whites. They were yes, they they were. after. They were. They only came to South Africa 120 years after the whites arrived there. Yeah. So, well, that's a very different picture than the one that's painted over here, I'll tell you. No, absolutely, Brian. And that's what annoys me so much. If, if you know, people would just look beneath the lies, they would realize that white South Africans are not these monsters that they've been painted worldwide. They were, it was a self-defense mechanism to allow them to have their own piece of land where they could have their own laws and, and not be overwhelmed by these warring black tribes. And so they, so yes, they had a the conflict between them. And they were basically coming there to try to take advantage of this, the Western ways. They, they like yes. the new technology. They, they probably like cars and machinery and like everything. I mean, the whole Western system is created uh, to uh, create uh, uh, one of the big impetuses is, is of technology is to make life easier, less arduous, right? Yes. So, you know. Yes. So they all wanted a part of that. And, and, and we were... At, at the height of white population in South Africa, we were never more than 6 million. So we were outnumbered eight, about 7 to 1 in those days. So we, we used them for the labor because there were never enough whites to do all the labor that was required. But we did not... We paid them, we looked after them, they had their own homeland to go home to. So... And we had our little piece of homeland as well, where they it was white by night. They were not allowed on the streets. They had to have a real good reason for being there. They had to carry a passbook, which was essentially a passport. They came from their own country into our country, and they had to carry this identification to say why they were there and what they were doing there. Well, but, I'll try this, Karen, to tell you this right now. My philosophy of good, of good uh, government and good political organization is that you sh you don't need to have everybody living with each other. It's actually no. nice to have multicultural systems that are separate, but integrated. You know what I mean? And it sounds to me yes. like that was what South Africa, the model they had used. Absolutely. I mean, as long as they weren't f shooting at these black people and they were paying them whatever was regular wage at that point, I, I don't, it, to me, it sounds to me like a very same way of organizing a, a multicultural well, I society. I believe it was because, you, you know, if you leave people on their own, they live with their own kind of people who speak the same language, have the same belief system. They, they do. They, they automatically migrate towards people of, of the same sort. Of so course. It's, it's, their, it's, it's, it's their family. In <laughs> yes. that culture, the family is everyone. I, I hope I – maybe I'm misspeaking here. I'm not really that knowledgeable of black – or tribal culture in Africa, but the general rule is that yeah, you're part of a tribe, and you're you know everybody in the tribe is is a friend. Yes. And, uh, yes. Why would you want not want to be with your friends when you're not working or whatever? When you're at home, you want to be with the people you want to be with. Yes, yeah, exactly. That you can feel safe and comfortable with. Yeah. So that is that is what we tried to do there, but the problem the the problem arose because. They wanted to be taught in their own languages. Now, what you need to understand, Brian, is that there were not words. There still are not words in their language to cover technology. Uh, they don't even have a word for tomorrow they, or, or for yesterday. They have a word for today, but they don't have words for next week or next month or anything like that. So yeah. how – and there were no books written in their language. So how did they expect – to be taught in, in, in their native languages. And they weren't teachers. They, they, they just wasn't the ability to do that. But that was the given reason for the uprisings which caused the whole uh, world to turn against South Africa. So the same as they are doing this week, the students went totally berserk and took to the streets in their thousands and they blocked the streets off with rocks and they burned cars and they looted stores and they they killed policemen and whatever. This is and recent. This is recent. This was in the 1970s when, when the world oh, started okay. and turned against South Africa. But they're doing the exact same thing this week, Brian. The same 
thing. The university students do not want to be taught in Afrikaans. They want to be taught in English. So it's exam time. And um, the pass, the, the failure rate in uh, South African universities is 81%. 81% fail. So because it's exam time, they don't want to write the exams, although they only need 30% to pass. So they are writing, looting, burning down the, the, the universities, attacking the police, attacking the lecturers, uh, preventing white students from going to, to, to study and write their exams. It is chaos in South Africa uh, for the last two weeks with these university students going crazy. Absolutely crazy in the streets. So that was what they did in the 1970s. And um, the police um, fired live, live bullets at them. And uh, the iconic picture of that poor little black guy who was killed uh, went worldwide. And the world turned on us and imposed sanctions against South Africa. So, right, the ANC took over in 1994. And... Uh, it was supposed to be a power-sharing thing that there would be white representation and black, but that didn't happen. It was just handed on a silver platter to the ANC who took over the country. Now, one of the first things they did was to disarm the white populace and confiscate all the firearms. Now, under the National Party government, we had to have firearm licenses. So the ANC inherited this database of who lived where and who had how many firearms, and they just confiscated the lot, saying this. Really? That, yes. Wow. Confiscated them. Wow. They, they then said, All you, you just hand them in at the police station and reapply for a license under the new government. Well, 20 years later, people are still waiting for their licenses. Those self-same firearms have disappeared at the rate of about three no, 30,000 of them have disappeared from the police stations. And there are certain police stations where you can rent a firearm for the day for $11. Now, do you really think that those police believe that they're renting a firearm out to some law-abiding citizen? Mm -hmm. So that was one of the first things they did. And now the, now the police force is primarily black. Yes, yes. Um, everything in South Africa, everything, every business, everything in South Africa has to be 90% black or you do not survive. They, they will, your business will not survive if you do not have 90% black from management level down to the cleaners. Are there still whites in the police, uh, in the police force? Is that exclusively there are black some. No, there are There are some, but um, th there's a case that is going to the United Nations um, in in. August next year, I believe, of a white woman who had worked her way up through the police force and was denied um, a promotion because she was white. And she's gone, to, exhausted all the courts in South Africa and is, it is now going to the United Nations to be investigated. The, so the thing in South Africa is that they then brought in they disbanded the commando system, which is a militia type of system, which defended the farms. They disbanded that and left the farmers to the mercy of the blacks. Now, in those 20 years, 4,000 white farmers have been murdered. And a, a murder in South Africa is not a drive-by shooting. They come into your house. They hold you there for days on end. They burn you with hot irons. They pour oil down your throat, set it alight. They rape the women with broken bottles and broomsticks and whatever comes to hand. They do the same to the female children. They drown uh, kids in boiling water, uh, burn them on a hot stove, etc. And eventually, as a mercy, maybe the whole family is killed. But more often than not, they will torture the father but leave him alive because they know that that is the worst thing you can do to a, a man is... Uh, to make him live the rest of his life knowing that he could not fulfill his primary function in life, which is to defend his family. So that is 4,000 farmers have been killed that way, but approximately 85,000 are the white. That's demonic. It is. It's not a war. It is. That's demonic cults. There's a lot of dark black magic in Africa. Well, I hate to be, you know... I, I'm not saying everyone there is, but there's a lot of nasty stuff going on there. And well, that's, that's cultural. It's been there for thousands of years. And as you say, 
It's not the fault of the white people that that stuff exists. It's not. It's it's in our culture too, unfortunately. But um, it, I don't think that the Africanus brought it there. It, it was there before, and now it's starting to show its ugly head. And evil Mary. is rising everywhere. I mean, this is just not in Africa, but it's it's I, I, this kind of stuff is just oh. It makes me sick to my stomach that humans could be so cruel to other humans. It's one thing to not like people, but to go to this extent, it's 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 terrorism at the highest levels. Well, absolutely, because Dr. Gregory Stanton, who is the head of, gen- of the International Genocide Watch, has placed South Africa on a level six of eight levels of genocide, and he said that... Uh, uh, it is going to happen there. It is a slow genocide that is happening. So, uh, in other words, um, bodies are not piling up in the streets, but uh, they are uh, destroying the culture, the language, um, the possibility to work. They're dehumanizing whites um, in South Africa, and it, it, it is more than likely going to happen. So we have 85,000 other white people killed. Now, in South Africa, the law says that if somebody breaks into your house in the middle of the night... So you're you saying not- that the reason, one of the reasons they're being uh, killed is because they've lost their ability to defend themselves. And that was the precursor, taking the gun. Yes, that too. But also given the fact that our, our president, Jacob Zuma, sings at the opening of parliament, and at any given opportunity, he sings a song called Bring Me My Machine Gun. Uh, We're going to shoot the Boer. Now, the Boer is a generic word for white South African. We're going to shoot them. The Congress is going to shoot them. We're going to drive them into the sea. Bring me my machine gun. Shoot, shoot. He sings that at the opening of Parliament. And as I say, whenever he gives a speech, he sings that song to huge applause. So if that is not from the very top levels of the country an incitement to go out and kill white people, then, then I don't know what is. Mm-hmm. So, we now have 4,000 farmers and about 85,000 other white people. Uh, oh, here. yeah, I'm just, cur- just curious, Karen. Has any, any of these demonic worshippers been caught and punished for these horrible crimes against whole families? I mean, this is just, oh, I just find it so despicable. It's well, the, it is very hard to get statistics out of South Africa. But it is said that 14% of criminals are caught, and of those, possibly 5% of that 14% actually end up in jail. Because this is what happens. When they attacked my parents on their farm um, and shot my father and shot my brother, my mom called the police, and the police said, can you identify your attackers by name? And my mom said, absolutely not. How how am I supposed to do that? And they said, well, then we cannot help you. And they didn't even come. And I have seen this week another two cases where that has happened, where the police have asked the people, can you identify your attackers by name? Sorry, we can't help you. Now, so you understand that, that, that they have no interest in catching these people whatsoever. In fact, if someone breaks into your house and you were to attack them with a knife or whatever, you w- will be the one who ends up in jail and they will walk free. So that is how it is in South Africa. But on Uh-oh. top of that, wow. on top of that, these poor white people... There are a hundred race-based laws protecting the black majority from the white minority. And those laws make it almost impossible for a white person to work in South Africa. Because your company is uh, gets a scorecard every month. And on that scorecard you get uh, marks for uh, the correct number, 90% black people in your employ, 90% black companies that you subcontract to, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. If you fail that, you will never get a government contract and you, you will, well, you, you will be highly fined and discriminated against. So the companies have just fallen in with this way of doing things. And so the whites have been displaced, dispossessed, will never get another job. So of the 3.5 million whites living in South Africa, 1 million and rising every day of them have lost their jobs, their homes, their vehicles, the schooling for their kids, and have nowhere to live, which is approximately 20 20 to 25% of the white population. Now, 
The government does not give grants to white people. So you do not get social security as you would here. You do not get child grants. You do not get anything from the government. So you are left out there on your own. So Mm -hmm. what has happened is that um, in a lot of cases, white people who have got land have either donated it or rented it out to these dispossessed whites uh, in order to build shacks on them and give them some safety in numbers and some protection from the weather. Now, as I said before, in South Africa, you have to pay to go to school. You have to wear a uniform. You have to buy your own books. And there's no school bus like there is here. You have to get to and from school on your own devices. And there are no school lunches. You take your own. So these people who are engineers, doctors, lawyers, um, living in these awful, awful conditions, have to try and educate their children. So they're doing what they did during the Boer Boer War. They're teaching their children to read and write at home. But Mm -hmm. the government is not allowing them to have permanent structures there. So you cannot put up a schoolroom or you cannot put up a church or you cannot put up anything of that sort. So it is a very, very, very bad situation there because the few whites who are still working cannot possibly support the the million whites who are not working. And of that million, 350,000 or so are children. So these children have absolutely no future whatsoever. They're malnourished. They don't have, well, the hospitals in South Africa is a story for another day, but they are non-existent. They don't have drugs. If you go to hospital, you have to take your own mattress, your own sheets, your own food, your own medication, and somebody to look after you. So this is because all the tax money is being stolen by the government. No, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, And if you bring your own mattress, you often, it's put on a a floor in a corridor and you have to share it with another patient. So there's just no hope for these people at all. And that is why I do what I do, uh, because we need to help those people. Now, there are there is a very, very good charity in South Africa that uh, deals with 485 of these white squatter camps and helps the people. Um, I'll tell you the worst squatter camp. It's a place called Munsieville. There was a squatter camp at Coronation Park where people had lived for about 14 years and they had established little vegetable gardens and um, they were they were doing okay. But the government decided that they didn't want them to live there anymore, so they sent in bulldozers one day without any warning to bulldoze the houses down. Now, a great South African patriot and activist, Sunette Bridges, she quickly got a court injunction to stop the bulldozing of those shacks uh, uh, so that we could find somewhere else for those people to live. And... um, we found uh, she is creating a, a place called Plain Filet where a hundred of them live, but there were still 200 other families that couldn't go there. So the government said, okay, we're going to give you a place to live. And they sent them to an unreconstituted garbage heap that had stopped being used as landfill about three weeks before. And they put up tin huts, Four walls and a roof, one door, no ventilation, no floors. The, the houses didn't even have um, foundations. So when when they moved, they were only allowed to take their clothes. So they went there without any of their possessions from Coronation Park, and they moved into Munsieville. And the first night there, there was an incredible storm, and most of the houses leaked through the roofs, so the people were sitting on this mush of garbage with all that that contains, babies, children and all, and some of the houses blew away because they're not fastened to the earth in any way. So they just blew away. And that is where the ANC government thinks is the right place for white South Africans to live. So, God. this, yeah, uh, Brian, it is the most horrible thing. You, you, you have no conception. Um, I'm going to give your your listeners and yourself a website where you can go and have a look at the huts, the conditions, and what this particular charity does for these people. 
It is called South African Family Relief Project. So their website is safrp with another sa dot org. And if you go to that website, you will see the some of the awful conditions that these people are forced to live in and have no way out of. Now, to add to their misery, so weather in South Africa goes in seven-year cycles. There's seven years of rain and seven years of drought. They're in the middle of a drought cycle right now. So together with the farmers that have been killed and the farmers whose farms have been taken away from them and handed over to the blacks, which are no, no, no longer productive farms, and the burgeoning population, there is a for food extreme food shortage in South Africa. So well, and, and businesses are not allowed to donate to these camps because they are white. They, they, there is a, a, a orphanage in, in near, near Pretoria called Yakaranda, and the, the government closed down all loans to this or, orphanage because they were 75% white, and you are not allowed to be that. It, to qualify to get donations, you have to be 90% black. So, that makes no put, sense. So they've made, they basically re reversed the apartheid to now uh, the, the gross discrimination against the white people. Totally, it's right. Just, I mean, it's just so ridiculous that, you, you know, we... The Jews claim they were wiped out by the millions, by the Nazis. What are they doing to the Palestinians? I mean, it's just so, it's so sad to see the human race can't see uh, how how despicable they are when they are in power versus when they're out of power. It's just, oh, it's just such a contradiction. It's just, it, it amazes me. It's been like this for 6,000 years. Uh, yeah, I know. And, and I would urge people as well, if you have a strong stomach, to Google pictures of uh, white farm murders in South Africa. But you need a strong stomach because the things that I have described in this program are minor in the bigger scheme of the murders of whites in South Africa. No. But, you know, you, you can see for yourself that I, I am not exaggerating. I am not... Uh, being a, a, dra a drama queen, I'm simply trying to tell a story and get some help for these people who have no hope whatsoever because they cannot leave the country because they do not have the money and there's hardly a country in the world that will take them. They do not have refugee or asylee status because the United Nations or Amnesty International have to declare South Africa an unsafe country for whites, which they will not do. So no country will take them as refugees. So they are stuck there being slaughtered. There are 95 murders a day in South Africa. That's black and white. But there are none white on black. There are three and a half thousand rapes a day in South Africa. None white on black. Black on black and black on white, yes. Not one white on black. So my people are under threat and uh, uh, being annihilated uh, in, in many ways. Their language is being taken away from them. Their monuments are being broken down. Their statues, their towns are having their names changed. Um, they dispossess dispossessed, they're unable to work. There's a quota system for universities, so that out of every hundred, two are allowed to be white to go to university, no matter what your qualifications are. So there is no hope and no future for these people unless somebody steps in and helps them. They, they need help, desperately. And, and the world is not talking about it. The mainstream media is ignoring it. And I, I don't know. Well, there's I'm 66 wars on the planet, and all we hear about is the one over in Iraq, in Syria. Yeah. I mean, it's just we're fixated on anything to do with Israel and the Middle East. Mm. But, but Africa is, is on fire. As I was saying, these students this week were burning whole towns down. And, and not just that. Yesterday in South Africa, the municipal workers were not happy with the, the pay that they are getting. 
and so they they went on strike and they rioted in the parliament buildings the police had to use stun grenades to get them out of there yeah. so they invaded parliament and were dancing and singing and, and waving sticks and carrying on as only they can and well, then you don't produce enough food to feed the population you have to import food to a place like south africa i bet you it's very expensive and, yes, it was, uh, it was the breadbasket of Africa. I don't know what your exchange rate is like or your currency, but yeah. terrible. Uh, it, used to be, it used to be two rand to the dollar. Today, it is over 14 rand to the dollar. So, you know, the money is worth nothing, even if you can <laughs> earn some. How did you get out? I mean, you were so lucky you got out of that hellhole. You know what, Brian? I never intend to leave. I never intended to leave. I, I, I was an activist in my country and I intended to stay there. But th this is a very, very funny story. It's a kind of a fairy tale. Um, my daughter was getting married and we, we had uh, lived on the same property forever. We, In all her life, we had never lived on separate properties. I had a cottage and she had, well, I had the main house and she had the cottage, which we switched when she got married. So I realized that she was getting married and I needed to do something with my time. I wouldn't be able to spend evenings with her. So um, she suggested that I go online and meet people online. So I went on to a, a, a dating site and I only spoke to people as far away as possible. So I had no intention of finding a husband or going out on dates, just chatting with people, learning about their country and and so on. So I met my husband online and uh, he lived 10,330 miles away from me, which seemed safe. <laughs> but within six weeks, he had flown to South Africa to meet me. And uh, in a f further six weeks, we were married. Now, well, there are he, some smart Texans. That's all I can say. <laughs> one of them. Yeah, he's a very, very, very good man. However, because he's white and male, he couldn't find a job in South Africa. And uh, having so he moved been, there for a while. So he experienced and saw all this. He stuff lived there too. for two years. For two years, he lived there, um, and and I think he would have stayed had he been able to find a job. But he said that real men do not get supported by their wives. So we are coming to the USA, um, where he can support me, and that that. That began a whole other can of worms to try and get myself immigration papers to come to the United States was a two-year, 25,000 rand nightmare of note because the papers that I needed were impossible to get out of the black government there. And when I did get them, I'd go to the embassy and hand them in and your embassy would say it's printed on the wrong paper, go back and start again. So it was an incredible incredible nightmare for me to leave that country. So they don't want people to get out either. No, they don't. They don't want them they don't want them there, but they don't want them to leave because they know that that is their taxpayer base and and that is their uh creative base as well. So they well, don't want to start you for as much money as they can to before you can leave. That's and I have one other theory about that, Brian, as well, is that that, that, that the only thing that unites these disparate tribes in South Africa right now is the hatred for the whites. If the whites were not there, they would turn against each other. So it is in the government's best interest to keep the whites there as a focus for hatred rather than have the 11 tribes fighting each other. Mm -hmm. So... And that that's my theory. Um, I, I, you know, I don't have anything to back that that story up, but that's what I think. So they make it almost impossible for you to leave. Anyway, so then we came here and ended up in Texas, and uh, I realized that there's nothing. Well, I mean, you, you could say the people that are there now that are stuck in these horrible camps, they 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 don't have twenty five thousand rand to get out. They're stuck. No. They've had everything no, they, stolen. They don't. They they fear for their lives. They are scratching for a meal every day. They're trying to educate their children in impossible circumstances. Uh, how, how, Brian, do they even think about getting a visa to leave the country? It, it, they can't. It's impossible. So they are trapped there 
in dire circumstances um, that that uh, there seems no way out of it because this charity that I'm telling you about, they went to this Munsieville camp and they put up, um, we call them Wendy houses. I'm, I'm sure you would call them a wooden shed here, a garden shed. They put up Wendy houses for these people to live in because that corrugated iron that the houses are made of, my friend who works there, burnt herself against it the other day. They are so hot in this hot weather that she actually burnt herself against the heat of that, that thing. Now imagine the elderly, the ill, or the children living in those circumstances. Not a blade of grass, not a tree, two toilets. No, one toilet for every three houses that gets cleared every two weeks. So can you imagine? And two Two forces of running water in the entire camp of 300 people. Oh, it's unbelievable. So, I you understand the, cruelty, the, the capabilities of our race to be cruel to others is just, you know, it's just unbelievable. It's so sad. So, what, there's one other thing that you spoke about was the black magic, and I'd like to speak to you about that too. Because the Africans, although they, they say they are Christians, they worship their ancestors. And they uh, have Sangomas, which is a witch doctor. And the Sangoma, and, and now AIDS is rife in South Africa, absolutely rife. I, I think it's about uh, four in ten black people have AIDS. So the Sangoma has told them that the way to cure AIDS... Let me just tell you a little story. I had a friend, well, I knew of a family. They sent their kid to South Africa. Uh, it was a uh, on a charity mission. I don't know what they were doing, but this da- this girl was like, well, she's, you know, whatever, how good looking she is, is irrelevant. But she went to the doctor, and the doctor tried to rape her. Yes. Yes, Africa. because they... The the doc- <laughs> I mean, honest to God, if the doctors are trying to rape the patients... You can imagine what the average male is trying to do there, and which well, is a big problem. Well, the Sangomas have told them that sex with a virgin is the, is the way the cure for AIDS. So for for them, a virgin oh. is white baby. So your babies are not safe in that country because they are the cure for AIDS. Oh, you're kidding! No, oh, that is absolutely unbelievable. Truth. Unbelievable! It's I can't absolutely. Believe it. And then they, they, they make muti, which is medicine, out of body parts. So they will kidnap white and white children to get the body parts to make stronger muti uh, to, for sale to their clients. It, it, I, I watched a video today by Sangoma where he says you must go to the mortuary. But you have to have contacts, and you can go to the mortuary and you can buy the bodies and 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 buy, use the body parts. But it's better if you kill them yourself because then you have their strength, and your ancestors are at rest after you have the strength of the people that you've killed. So the the, the this savage uh, uh, situation is foreign. To I can see why the Chinese mind. fit in really well, Karen. They do the same thing to their own people. Yes. All their organs. Yes. Yeah. But but this kind of violence and barbarism is foreign to to a Western mind. The, 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 the mind cannot encompass it. So. No. Uh, it, well, it's, it's, I mean, Karen, you tell something to this money in the treat, they think you're nuts, or they just said, "Oh, I want to hear about this." Well, the thing I get most It's depressing. It's depressing. We're so egotistical and we're so self-absorbed. Oh, I don't want to hear about bad news. Tell me something good, something something (laughs) pretty, something sweet, you know? Yes, yes, but I uh, don't uh, have a sweet story to tell, Brian, and I wish (laughs) there was an answer, but the story is not sweet. And can you imagine, every single day, I immerse myself in this because in order to do a show like yours, I need to know the latest things happening in South Africa. And every single day, there are gangs of six of these blacks beating, murdering, raping elderly people, old ladies, um, burning them. Oh, man. Man. It's, wow. That must be tough to stomach. I mean... You're obviously a saint, my dear. That's all I can say. You're a saint. You love your 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 uh, 
your country uh, and your people, and it's just, oh, uh, I, I feel for you. I really do feel for you. This Brian, is the I worst, want some uh, help. This is the worst thing I've heard in a long time. This I just is. want some help for them. I want people to know that they are not the monsters that they have been painted. They, they are ordinary people like you and I, just ordinary, normal people who want to raise their families, uh, have a home, live their lives. Uh, they are warm, welcoming kind people they are god fearing people they 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 oh. are they is this known to the embassy in in the US and Canada do you know if it's well known to the governments we have a team of people that, that I've put together and every month we send every single member of congress we send to the embassies we send to the UN we send letters with an update on what is happening in south africa and you know not one person has acknowledged even receipt of those letters they will not look at it but they can't say they don't know i have a friend in um uh I've had him on my show quite a few times. He lives in South Africa. And he said there's something called the Special Rapporteur for the for the UN. Who, they deal with this sort of situation. He's dealing with an issue with them being droughted out of their land by a, a large plantation that should never have been put there because they're in the desert. Uh, you know, it's not a great situation, but they're not being raped and pillaged and murdered. And, I mean, this is far more urgent than what he's dealing with. And he's gone to the top of the UN. So well, you should probably well, chat with him about how uh, what what avenues he took because he said these are about the only people in the UN that actually have any clout whatsoever. I, I the, the the whole UN is a failed institution in my opinion. It's like I say, maybe point zero five percent of it does any good. Um, <clears throat> that's my opinion. That's I UN, agree with you. He said these people are good. He said the people he's dealing with are actually trying and they're they're making some strides. The other thing I would suggest. Is that we uh, we try to get the uh, global eco village movement involved? They're they're big time in Africa. Uh, I know they have a lot of places there, and maybe they can help these people. Really, yeah. if they could, if they could just get a decent place to live, you know. Yeah, just get them moved. I mean, it sounds to me like if you're living on a garbage dump, that's not a good place to grow food. No. No, and I, this is very, fairly recent that they've been moved there. So, and and then it was winter, and really nothing grows in winter, um, unless you have a greenhouse or any of those things, which obviously they don't have. Well, so, yeah, Kasha moved. Kasha was so fed up with the ANC thing, and she saw both sides were were wrong, and so she just took a walk and she went to a, like an eco village that was somewhere in South Africa. I have no idea where it was, uh, and she stayed there for a few years, and it was blacks and whites living. In peace together because they 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 were a family. They created a family, a little community, and it, it's a beautiful story she tells. Uh, so maybe that community would help these people. I don't know. I would think that they'd know about it by now if this is going on, but uh, maybe they're not there anymore. Maybe they've been pushed out too. But she said it was a black and white community living in harmony. She was so impressed. Yeah, I, I'm sure that can happen because I am not saying, Brian, that every single black person is a murdering terrorist uh, rapist. I'm not saying that. And I'm not saying that the blacks are not suffering as well because, as I said, the black oh, unemployment rate in South Africa is 52%. It's all so they're down. Suffering. It's going to become another Zimbabwe <laughs> if it isn't that bad yet. Yes, yes. But my my focus is obviously on the white people because they are a, a minority who are under threat. And as I say, there is no very, very, very little white on black crime. It is all the other way around or black on black. So my focus is not on the black people. My focus is on saving the small, small remaining white people that live there. But I, I really worry because the... the are shortages of food. There's short water shortages are chronic. Um, the the lady in charge of that charity contacted me the other day and said she's trying desperately to get bottled water to these camps because there is no water. So you know, and they're suffering a heat wave, and it's early summer right now. So you know, the elderly and and the kids are going to dehydrate and die. Mm. 
we need to get them help. Yeah, it sounds like they want them to. That's the plan. They put them there to die. That's why they took I, them away from the much better. It sounds like they were living in a much better place before, right? Before they took them out. Well, it was right. Their gardens. It, they had they they had an established place at least. Where now they they just have nothing. But but the ordinary citizen in South Africa as well, Brian. They live behind eight foot walls with electrified wiring on top of the wall. They have electronic gates. They have burglar bars on every window. They have security gates at their front and back doors. They have an alarm system. If they can afford it, it's connected to a security company. And they are still not safe. Mm -hmm. They are still not safe. So they've made themselves prisoners in their own homes. And yet... And yet, there are still 95 murders a day in South Africa. Not all white murders, nevertheless, 95 murders a day and 3,600 reported rapes. And they say that only 50% of crime gets reported in South Africa. So double those figures and look at the size of Texas and cry, because that's what we're looking at. Mm-hmm. Yeah. What about the, uh, the rich South Africans that may have the resources to help these people? Are they helping it out at all? Okay. Now, Brian, I'm, I'm sure you understand that we have liberals in every community. And so what I'm thinking is that the, they, the rich people have either have their own businesses or are well established in business. Now, because of those laws, their business cannot contribute to whites. And if they are... Uh, uh, high up in an established business, they can't be seen to do that. So businesses are not are not donating to, to the whites, not food, not anything. I mean, they can't and, hire a truck, fill it full of food and drive it there and give it to the people? No. That's considered a contribution? No, you are not allowed to do that. Oh, it's like that. This, these idiots in Florida try to throw people in jail for uh, feeding uh, people yes. starving on the street. And yes. they bought it. And yes. they it's the same kind of law. It's exactly that. So you're not allowed to do that. And, and obviously people who are living in a gated community and are well off do not want to rock the boat of their own lives. So they turn a blind eye to it. So it is the poor helping the poor. And, and it's, it's an impossible situation. Absolutely impossible. Mm -hmm. Wow. Well, I'm glad I had you on. I had no idea it was this bad. Honest to God, I, I figured that there was a lot of revenge kind of killing going on, that it was going to become another Zimbabwe. Did this sort of thing happen in Zimbabwe too? You Absolutely. Uh, you, you, they murdered the farmers. They threw them off their farms. They attacked them. They they killed them. They they. Zimbabwe is a basket case. I mean, instead of the bread basket of Africa, it's now a basket case. And they're asking the white farmers to come back. But I hardly believe that any person in their right mind would go back having been attacked and, and, and dispossessed. I don't think they will go back. But, the, yeah, it did happen there. Um, did these camps really form too? Were these camps not, formed? Not that, not that I know of. Uh, they may have been. But, you know, th th these regimes are so strict on what the media does or does not say that, that it could have happened and we don't know about it. Okay. Right? Let's, I, let's, I don't know. Yeah, let's, let's get the word out to the listener who's, uh, uh, you know, being touched by this. Hopefully it's a very tragic situation. Uh, if, if things that they could do to help, uh, is there a way they could contact you to, to help you out? Yes, certainly. Um, I have a website with my contact details and a donate button because you cannot send stuff to South Africa. The post office is bankrupt. The airways are not flying parcels for the post office because their bills are not being paid. And you get taxed on everything that gets sent to South Africa. So if you're sending a, a food and uh, a clothing parcel, the charity you're sending it to will be taxed on that parcel at the government's decision how much you should pay. So it's impossible to help them that way. So I have a donation site where every penny of it goes to them. You will get a letter from them thanking you. And rest assured that not one person who works for this charity gets a salary or anything. They're all volunteers. Um, my website is white 
genocidesa.com. Uh, and my contact details are on there. And if you'd like to ask me any questions or get in touch with me, you're more than welcome to. Um, say, we, say that again. What was the first part of it? What? How do you spell that? White. 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 Oh, okay. White. Genocide. S-A. Dot com. Okay. That's easy. Um, white. Genocide. South Africa. But just S-A. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it is under construction because I do not have much spare time. And I also have my own health problems. So the, <coughs> the website is up, but um, there is limited information on it. You can listen to other shows I've done and other people have done. You can see some of the things that are happening in South Africa. We are working on fleshing out the website some more. But that, that is the best place 